Let's see. You aren't my only class. So, last time we ended right before break about dealing with digestion and your gut microbiome is important, but we didn't talk about how we control what's going on. So let's do that real fast and then we'll talk sex and we'll be done with lectures. That's an entertaining way to end. So there's a system that I hinted at before, but we never really dealt with and that's called the enteric nervous system. It's a component of the autonomic nervous system. And what it turns out to be is a whole bunch of ganglia that are going to control your intestines. It's why we have a connection between your gut and your brain, because we happen to have this system. This is actually the way in which polio causes trouble. Because polio is a digestive system virus, but if polio hops into a nerve, which is not its intended target, it can make its way to your brain or to your spinal cord. Typically it's going to be your spinal cord, and the result is you get paralysis. It's a dead end. It's not the intended pathway for that virus. Last time, I mentioned that the coordinated smooth muscle contractions are referred to as peristalsis, because I told you how you can see peristalsis by looking at earthworm contractions. That's why if you swallow an ice cube, you can feel it going down your throat. It doesn't just fall, it's being slowly pushed down through peristaltic contractions. So we have this big old coordination center that we just collectively refer to as the enteric nervous system. It's not a nervous system proper, but it's a whole bunch of neurons that are kind of coordinating what's going on with your gut. And since your gut's kind of a big area, you happen to have this. If you look inside of intestines and slice open a human and look for this, you won't see it. It's a bunch of neurons, so it's a bunch of nerves that are all interconnected, and they're going to be kind of all over the place. Feedback for what's going on is primarily going to be driven by the medulla, and that's where you're going to be told you're full, you're not full. The catch is this feedback is slow. It's a slow feedback system. The reason why it is slow reflects our evolutionary past. And our evolution is we don't get to eat much. Especially if it's something tasty. So what are you meant to do? You're a glutton. You eat as much as you can because who knows when you're going to eat next. And then you feel full. Which is why they tell people who are trying to lose weight and they're wanting to only do that through diet, they need to eat slowly. The reason why is you're more likely to feel full because you're giving yourself the chance to feel full. But if all you do is just eat because you're hungry and I'm not full yet, you're always full afterwards. It's kind of like for those of you who do all you can eat sushi or you do Korean barbecue, it's always, oh, I should have stopped so many rolls ago. Or, oh, I should have stopped like two orders of bulgogi ago. And then you're like, oh, I think I screwed up. No, you didn't screw up. It worked as expected is what happened. You're just not used to it because we don't need to worry about when your next meal is. The problem is our biology hasn't caught up because this is a relatively new phenomenon and it only is a phenomenon in part of the world. 
we're going to use hormones and neurohormones primarily to pull this off. This particular case here, these are going to be um, neurotransmitters. These hormones are going to be ones that you haven't heard of. So what are some of these hormones? They're slow, and they're going to do a whole bunch of weird things. So some of these kind of sort of make sense. So gastrin is from the stomach, and it goes to the stomach. And it's going to tell your stomach to secrete HCL, and it's also going to tell it to... Uh, need. Meaning, make your stomach start working. You know how you can start thinking about food and then suddenly the gurgle gurgle kicks in? Like me bringing up all-you-can-eat sushi or maybe having some Korean barbecue kind of makes you kind of feel hungry? And then you suddenly start to feel the gurgle gurgle kicking inside your stomach? It's fast to act. That would just be the gastrin kicking in. So what uh, in and out ba are banks on when you drive past one at 10.30 in the morning, right before they w open up? What do you notice about an in and out outside of there's no line at 10.30 in the morning? You smell something. What? All of them do the exact same thing, and that's because it's a really good smell. Have you never paid attention to the smell? They start frying onions. You're smelling onions. And the smell of onions can travel a long way, and it's always a... I know that smell. Where's that coming from? And suddenly you get hungry. That's why they do it. They're trying to make you hungry and say, oh, a double-double sounds really good right now. I could go for a double-double. Maybe I'm so hungry I could go for a three by three or a four by four. I'm not sure. But it needs to have a chocolate milkshake with it, too. Pretty sure it needs a milkshake. <laughs> and how you are starting to be like, I hate this. I don't like this game. Make it stop. Because you know where you're going after this, and you know it's going to be a 45-hour wait because of how bad that line is. Even though it'd be like a little bit shorter if you walked in, but even then it's not necessarily going to be that much better. Anyway, there's another hormone called CCK. CCK stands for cholecystokinin. Kinin means move. Cysto references the gallbladder. Cola references bile. So what do we see as the job of CCK? It's telling the gallbladder to release bile. And if you recall, it's been a week, so maybe not. The job of bile is to emulsify fat. Emulsify meaning dissolve. It's why you add soap when you're trying to clean up something that's greasy. The soap turns out to be amphipathic. It's hydrophobic and hydrophilic at the same time. So it can dissolve in water and dissolve the fat. Bile is the exact same thing. It's there to help you dissolve the fat. Otherwise, you have fat globs in your feces and fat globs in your small intestine which you're not able to digest fully because they're fat globs. The bacteria, when they get to it, will be able to digest it, and they say thank you by throwing a party. The way you know they throw a party is you get diarrhea. Who has to worry about this? Pardon? I thought I heard. If you need to have your gallbladder removed, you worry about this. You must modify your diet. So if you have a really bad bladder stone, they might take it out. If it gets infected, they might take it out. 
my grandmother had to have it taken out. Not because she had bladder stones, not because she had an inflamed gallbladder. She had pancreatic cancer. And there's a medical procedure that's done that's referred to as the Whipple procedure. The Whipple procedure is evil incarnate, but it gave her an additional two or three years with having pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer is one of those that if you're told, like, you know the joke of like, oh, you have three months to live or you have six months to live? That's pancreatic cancer, where they're not joking and they're telling you the maximum amount of time you have. If they say you have three months to live, eh, probably a month and a half. It is a evil, evil cancer if you get it. The Whipple procedure is everywhere I just circled, they more or less um, chop it out. So you need to remove your gallbladder, you remove the first part of your small intestine called the duodenum, you chop out a good chunk of your pancreas, you chop out part of your stomach, because that's where the cancer tends to spread to. And the result is, you're going to have screwed up digestion for the rest of your life, the way that the script digestion will manifest is you're going to lose a lot of weight. You're also probably, and this is going to sound funny, it's not meant to be funny, but it kind of is. You're also probably going to destroy the plumbing of any toilet you use because you're going to have unregulated bowel movements. And yeah, you're going to need a new plumber because you are going to clog it with that much crap. Which again, is kind of funny, kind of not funny, but kind of funny. So anyway, do you know what last Friday was called? According to plumbers? Called Brown Friday. Because of how much clogged toilets all the plumbers have to go deal with. Why? Because... All the foods you ate for Thanksgiving are all the foods that are the ones that are really good at helping you clog that toilet. So it is truly their most magical day of the year because they make all the money dealing with all your crap. Anyway, um, the job of Secretin is kind of counterintuitive. Its job is going to stop gastrin. Same thing with CCK, it's also going to stop gastrin. The reason why is if we need to act on the small intestine, we want the small intestine to do its thing, we don't want stomach acid coming on in. Stomach acid is good in the stomach. It is not good in the small intestine. You'll eat holes in things, so we need to stop it. Secretin is also going to cause the secretion of gastric juices, or it's not gastric, but pancreatic juices. Which means if you need to have your pancreas removed, you are going to have other digestive issues where you can't digest most of your food. Oh, did it get moved? Is it already out? It is. So you have to buy pancreas pills that will let you digest your food. They're part of your lab on Thursday. We're using actual medication that's needed by people who don't have a functioning pancreas. And if you were to look at it, they tell you pancreatin 1300. Yeah. With proteases, amylases, and lipases. What are the big three that get secreted by your pancreas? Proteases, amylases, and lipases. Fun. Insulin, we've met before. The job of insulin there is to lower your extracellular fluid glucose.
The job of glucagon is to increase your extracellular fluid glucose. So if you wanted to absorb more sugar, which hormone would you secrete? Insulin or glucagon? You want to absorb it from what you are eating. What would you secrete? If we think about it, we know from last time, I know it's been a while. Inside your small intestine, you absorb whatever nutrients are in there, and you put it directly into your bloodstream. Insulin, don't have as much. Glucagon, let there be more. Which one would absorb and put it into your bloodstream? Glucagon. This one says, put it into your bloodstream. This one would say, don't you dare absorb it. Don't you dare absorb it. Because the goal is to lower the glucose supply. If it is in your bloodstream, just for the sake of saying this, if glucose is in your bloodstream, insulin is going to make you put it into your cells. So if you were trying to grow, insulin is good. Because you're saying, let's shove energy molecules directly into your cells, and let's do it more than we normally would. Everyone likes to joke about how, oh yeah, if you want to be a bodybuilder, you should be taking steroids. Technically, you mean to say anabolic steroids. They have some weird side effects. What you really mean to put in is insulin. Insulin is the bodybuilding hormone. Because it's the one that's going to streamline energy molecules right into your cells. The problem with it is... If you overdo it, because you're not paying attention to what your blood glucose actually is, you will go hypoglycemic. Hypoglycemic is when you don't have enough blood sugar floating around. And that, have any of you ever, who knows diabetics? Those of you who know diabetics, are they insulin injectors? Those of you who know the insulin injectors, have they ever given themselves too much insulin? How do you know? Yeah, they pass out. You, you, it's lights out if you have it. If it's a, depending on how they go down, they might trigger seizures. My grandfather, who died in May, he was particularly fond of drinking lots of alcohol. Alcohol screws with your ability to regulate uh, blood sugar. He would still take his insulin, though. So how would we normally find out that he was doing this? Because he'd be passed out at the bar. Not because he was drunk, but because he had a shot of tequila and still took his insulin. And he would pass out. We had many memories of having dinners where, Grandpa, why are you passing? Oh, damn it. And we knew what it was. Sometimes he would come with seizures. Those are entertaining if you've never seen a hypoglycemic seizure or just seizures in general. They're very entertaining. And by entertaining, I mean they're not entertaining. Uh, I remember one time vividly where we were over at my grandparents' house. It happened. Paramedics come over, and it turned out my, one of my brothers was there, and he was like, oh, Mr. whatever the guy's name was. Because it turned out to be the dad of one of my brother's best friends. I was like, oh, you're the paramedic. And like, oh, funny, we're seeing each other. Grandpa's passed out. Here's what happened. And, you know, all that other fun stuff. The issue with insulin, low or too much insulin, resulting in you being hypoglycemic, is an immediate no-no. It's an immediate, this is bad. If you are hyperglycemic, meaning you're not secreting, you're not putting in enough insulin, and the 
glucose is too high, you don't know. It takes decades for the glucose to kill off your nerves. And that's why diabetics have to all, especially if they've been diabetic for a long time, they're always checking something. They're always checking their toes. That's because that's where the nerves die first. And they can go necrotic on you if you're not paying attention, meaning the tissue dies and then it rots, which means you chop it off. You can't save what's already dead. Leptin is a fun hormone that comes from fat. And it says, I'm full. That's an odd one. It's your fat that tells you that you're full. Hmm. PYY turns out to tell you that you are hungry. And this is a peptide. It's called peptide Y, so it's PYY. There are others, like there's a great one called ghrelin. Ghrelin says that you are hungry, but it comes from your stomach. There's, there's all sorts of hormones that show up with this that you've never heard of. The interplay of insulin and glucagon, hooray. You normally don't have an issue here. Because you could just eat and fix it. Insulin is typically, if there's going to be a problem, it's going to be insulin. It's going to be the lowering that's the trouble. Can you use behavior to fix this? To a degree. So if you're a diabetic, an insulin-dependent diabetic, there are some things you can do to help fix it, like exercise more to help lower it down. But if it's going to be high, you're probably not going to be able to exercise enough to offset that slice of chocolate cake you just had. Like, you don't have the 10 hours you need to exercise it off. Uh, yay. Shall we talk sex? Okay. Let's talk sex. So we're going to do a few versions of it. We're going to do the asexual version because that's entertaining. Then we'll do the sexual version because that's actually not as entertaining. There's a lot of body parts involved. And then we'll talk the hormones involved. Okay. So objectives, objectives, objectives. Animals got to reproduce. The easiest way to reproduce is asexually, and the reason why asexual reproduction is easier is because you don't need to deal with anyone else. And people suck. Some of you work at the happiest place on earth, which means you really know people suck. Who works retail jobs? Oh, yes, we already established. So... You know people suck. Do any of you work in, like, restaurants? So you really know people suck. I'm one of those where I do not, like, so as Janet can tell you, there's cast member compliment cards, and then you have cast member complaint cards. Which one is far more common? Is the compliment or the complaint far more common? Complaint is always common. I'm I'm the one, it doesn't matter what I am, because I'm one of eight trillion. I have never given a complaint card. And like if I go to a restaurant, I'm the person who always gives 20% no matter what. Because I would be fired before I started working any job that's retail or involves food service. I would be fired so fast. I'd walk in like who are the idiots? And I'm done. Like, I... So I do not believe in complaining about anyone in one of those jobs, because, nah. Reason why? P. 
people suck. So there are some organisms that say, yeah, people suck. We don't need to deal with them. Let's do asexual reproduction. It is insanely rare in, amongst the animals. If you look collectively, this is not a common occurrence. The main ways that you will see this, one version is through fission, meaning they just divide. So they can split themselves into two. You'll tend to see this amongst the worms. This will be possible. Another one of the common ways that you will see this is through budding. Budding is when they make tiny clones that fall off. You'll see this amongst some hydras. We'll do this. But both cases, these are kind of tiny organisms that do this underwater. If you start looking on land, what you'll tend to see, if it's going to be true asexual reproduction, is parthenogenesis. Parthenogenesis is what you could call in, how to say this, religious speak, a virgin birth. These are females only. And the result is female, usually giving offspring, to female. It's typically what you see. In invertebrates, the way that this manifests is amongst the hymenoptera. Hymenoptera are the stinging insects, if you don't recall. So these will be things like bees and wasps and hornets, and ants. The way these turn out to work is if you look at the queen, the queen is going to be a diploid, and all of her workers are also diploid. So then how do you get the males? The males are haploid. The queen and the workers are genetically identical. So what's the difference between the queen and the workers? The queen's popping out the babies. Only difference. Well, why? The workers do not have functioning reproductive organs. Have you heard of the royal jelly before when dealing with like ants and bees? The royal jelly is just a type of food that's given to them that turns on the reproductive organs. That's it. The difference between queen and the uh, workers is functioning parts. That's it. But for the most part, they're clones of each other. Every once in a while, a male will get kicked out. Sexual reproduction could occur, but for the most part, it only happens once, and then you just kind of keep on moving. With invertebrates, or sorry, not invertebrates, but with the vertebrates, we'll see it with lizards. They will typically have low population density, so there's no competition. They're usually in stable environments. If we have no competition, we have stable environments. This means no evolution pressures. If there's no evolutionary pressures, what's the point of having sex? Sex is there to shuffle the deck, to change around your genetics. But if there's no evolutionary pressure, then there's no need to do it. Which means, hit delete on the males. There's no reason to keep them around. They're there to cause trouble. So what you get are populations of lizards that are nothing but female. There's no need to have males. What you need, however, is some triggers to convince the female that they need to ovulate. So they will go through sex 
acts even though nothing is happening. It's just behaving like there's sex enough to make whoever is the, quote, female, unquote, in the pair say, oh, pop out the eggs. And then you swap positions and then, oh, pop out the eggs. But it turns out they just play a game of messing with their hormones, and that's through their behavior, and it makes clones. They do not go through mitosis, or they do not have meiosis. They only go through mitosis. And if you think about it, meiosis is really, and I pointed this out before, two rounds of mitosis. So it's not really that far off just to stop one of them and then you're done. Yep, oh, already pointed them out. So let's go sexual sexual reproduction. Let's deal with the weirdos first. Hermaphrodite is common yet not what you think it necessarily is. It does not mean that you are half male and half female. It means you have female reproductive parts and you have male reproductive parts. That's all it means. It doesn't mean you're half and half. It just means you have one set and you have the other set. It's not half of a set. You have a full female set. You have a full male set. Some cases... They can reproduce with themselves, so they are self-fertilizing, but that does not mean it's asexual. It just means it's self-fertilizing. Asexual means you don't need any repro you don't need any of those parts. You just need to make a clone. The most famous of these are the gastropods. So think of snails, namely snails. Um, a lot of flatworms turn out to be this way. Earthworms can be this way. Where they need another to reproduce. So you'll swap sperm while taking sperm. Because it's a two-way switch. Meaning, if you had two of them, we'll have sperm and we'll have egg, egg and we'll have sperm, Sperm will go from one snail to the other, and the other snail will swap sperm to the other. So you get a two-way swap. You can also have some fun ones, like sequential hermaphrodites, so they switch their sexes. The most famous of these, clownfish. Which is why Finding Nemo lied to you. Marlin should not have stayed Marlin. Once the mother died, Marlin, if he were the oldest, would have become, I don't know, Marlena. All the organs would have rearranged and ta-da, done. It's driven by hormones and who, where you are in the population as to if you're being repressed in the moment that the female is gone, you lose the repression, and then the oldest one swaps over. So let's assume none of that's going on. How are we going to fertilize these eggs? We have two choices to begin with. We have internal fertilization. This requires some trouble. You got to get the sperm in. It also means you need to get the zygotes out. So how you're going to pull that off, okay. You got to figure that one out. If you have external fertilization, this one here is now a game of did sperm and egg meet? So now this is a game of, like, did the parts run into each other? Example of internal or an external fertilizer would be, of course, eggs. Or uh, eggs. 
frogs. How does that happen? The male, the tiny one, grabs onto the female, and if he grabs on and squeezes in just the right way, she goes, oh, it's time. She starts shooting out these eggs that are formed as they're popping on out. And he has to drop sperm as quickly as the eggs are popping out. And you're hoping they did a good job. Other version. So this one is kind of, let's try and make the, pet, the matching happen. But you could also have things like corals or sponges. Where one of them will shoot sperm into the water. One shoots eggs into the water. And good luck, y'all. Hope for the best. So we can have varying degrees of success with making sure that the sperm and egg run into each other. With both of these, internal and external, it might be just random. So if it's random, what type of strategist would that be? An R strategist or a K strategist? R strategists follow exponential growth. K strategists follow logistic growth, meaning uh, we have to worry about maxing out. You just shoot sperm and egg into the air, or in this case, more appropriately, into the water. Which one are you? You're our strategists. Our strategists don't necessarily need to worry about this next part. If you, Some our strategists do, but not all of them. If you're a K strategist, it definitely is important. And that, of course, is, do you need to pair up? If courtship is involved, that usually means you need to impress someone else. The impressing part, so the courtship ritual, might be costly. If you had a peacock, they need to grow that big old fancy tail and show off to the females, look how fancy my tail is. Isn't it pretty? It takes a lot of energy to grow the tail. Also, if you've ever watched a peacock fly, they're kind of pathetic because the tail tends to drag them down. So if a cat says, I want to eat that, the peacock is at a definite disadvantage because its desire to say, look at me, aren't I pretty, makes it more vulnerable to attack. So there is a cost involved. If you need to sit there and say, let me build you a pretty house, so there's lots of fish that will sit there and build like little structures saying, look, I groomed my level of sand. Isn't it pretty? They need to spend hours on end making this and then defending it against other males who'd say, you did a nice job. I'd like to steal it from you. And if they're making it pretty and maintaining it, they're not eating. So it's kind of a whole bunch of time. If you have birds who are trying to say, look how pretty my house is. Did I not find the prettiest twigs for you? They're spending their time making it and maintaining it instead of eating. There are costs. Usually, we think of the males as the ones who need to do the courting. reason why it's the males is the females get to be selective with their eggs. It's far more energy to produce those eggs than it is to produce sperm, so the males have to be the pretty ones which tells you about how screwed up human society is. Because it's the males who try and convince the women that they need to impress the guys, when in reality, it's the guys who need to be impressing the ladies, who then need to be able to say, mm, no. It's a little screwed up the way we behave. Anyway, pheromones, which are aerosolized hormones, may play a role in this. 
in humans, we're not as sure because it's really hard to experiment on humans. But here's how you know that pheromones are, they have to be a thing. And guys are not as sensitive to pheromones. At least human guys aren't. Ladies, you particularly are. Because you are far better at saying, hmm, there's something wrong with that person. I don't know what it is. There's something wrong. And there is consistency with females saying, there's something wrong. I don't know. There's something wrong. There's something off. There's something off. You're probably smelling it. You're smelling it. And since you don't know what you're smelling, it's just, hmm, I have this feeling there's something wrong. Uh, I can't tell you what it is, but there's something wrong with that person. I, mm, let me tell you. Is it a sixth sense? No. It's called smell. Also, who has a better sense of smell? Men or women? Women do. Just saying. I don't think we need to argue about this one. But for the most part, there are three categories. None. One-sided or two-sided. Usually when it's one-sided, it is legitimately one-sided. The two-sided is usually a group. Meaning you'll sit there and actually have literally the village raising the children. What are humans? None, one-sided, or two-sided? Humans, honestly, the proper answer to this one, because all you have to do is look at our evolutionary past and you get the answer. Look at chimpanzees. How do they raise their children? As a group, not as individuals, as groups. How about bonobos? As groups. How about gorillas? As groups. How about orangutans? Groups. How about gibbons? Groups. How about humans? Groups. What well, doesn't feel that way? Oh, that's a comment commentary on society. That's not a commentary on biology. And even then, we still kind of sort of do this. Don't you ship your child off? Or, screw your children. Weren't you shipped off to school? And for some of you, when you were shipped off to school for a couple of hours a day, some of you were even fed when you were there. That sounds like we're pawning the kids off on a whole bunch of other people. We still follow this. Just not necessarily to the greatest degree, but we still kind of sort of do. Let's talk males first. Why? Because clearly they're the more important ones. There's a book, so I need to look it up. I'll look it up. I'll post it. I have not read the book. I only listened to an interview about it. So, because I'm a nerd, I listen to podcasts because the radio pisses me off. So, the science podcast is free, so anyone can download it. They have one a week. And every year, they for about half the year, they do a book series. This year, they focused on sex, gender, and science. The last book was just interviewed, and it's one of the staff writers who wrote it for science. So the person commented, like, this is so weird because I'm being interviewed about my bosses, about, like, my work, and I'm not sure how I'm supposed to be answering, but it's like, oh, this is so weird. And what the woman wrote about, she's not a Native American, so she immigrated here. I don't remember what country she's from. But her research, meaning for this book, not a PhD research, but her research for this book, because it was a question that she was interested in, she, if she doesn't have a PhD, she needs to work on getting this one, because when you listen to her work, it's like, yes, and why do you not have a PhD? If Again, if she doesn't have one, she probably does is on the patriarchy. Why? Why is there a patriarchy? 
and this interview, and it's like a 40 minute long interview. It's very much well worth the listen, where clearly she needs to give, we just need to get the book. But it's the latest one, so this is the one from last week. It dropped on Thanksgiving. The origin of it, as far as she can point out, and she's like, and this can shift, is Athens, Greece. Athens, Greece is the reason why a lot of the world deals with the patriarchy. Not Greece, Athens, Greece. Because, for whatever reason, and she didn't go into super details, which means, oh, buy the book. Or, we don't know. There, they, like, people say Athens is like the birthplace of democracy and intellectual ideas. It's the birthplace of democracy that we follow. It's not the birthplace of democracy. It's our version of it. And what was our version? The wealthy, white men got to vote. And if you weren't under those three words, you didn't get to vote. So let's see. Let's survey the room. So I'd be making the decisions for all of us. <laughs> this doesn't seem like a good battle plan, personally. But seriously, like, what? If you went to their neighbors to the east named Sparta, you know, them warriors where they made that movie 300, which is totally not true, but, you know, hell, why not? You know, it sounds like a good movie. They had women in charge. If you went to Egypt, which was technologically far more advanced than Greece, and they had far more thoughts about mathematics and astronomy than the Greeks, there were women pharaohs. They were far more inclusive. Yet, for whatever reason, we picked the Athens version of society, which follows a patriarchy. If we went anywhere else in the world, go to Asia, not a patriarchy. Go to Africa, not a patriarchy. Go to South America, not a patriarchy. Go to native tribes in the Americas, not a patriarchy. We picked this one. And that's why the males get to go first. Hmm. So, let's talk male anatomy. Because this is fun. Testes. Are the male ovaries. What? They're the male ovaries? Yes, I did not misspeak. They are the male ovaries. If you think about it, Males and females, if we put everything into a binary, we're forcing the binary. They need to have the same anatomical plan. You need to have the same parts. What we need to then do is, depending on which side of the binary you're trying to shove onto, is we need to just tailor some of them into other, like, let's make this version, this default, the male version, or we're going to take this default and turn it into the female version. In mammals, what's the default? Female is the default. Which means when I say testes are the male ovaries, that is not a lie. The default is an ovary. We just need to tinker it into testicle. Testes, in order for them to function, are temperature sensitive. Which means they cannot be in the body. They need to be outside of the body cavity. Which means we need to put them into a bag. We will call that bag a scrotum. The bag needs to be able to control its temperature so this will be speaking to the guys in the room who will confirm this. How do you control the temperature? There are two ways. Surface area to volume ratio, which is wrinkles or no wrinkles. Wrinkles equals 
get more heat out. No wrinkles equals don't need to worry about the heat. That's one thing that you can do. And second option is you can raise and lower them, which means there are muscles that control the raising and the lowering. And there's there are muscles that control wrinkled versus no wrinkled. For everyone else who does not experience this, how can you observe this without needing to like stare and go, ew, gross. All you need to do is watch a guy go into cold water. So guys, how fun is it to walk slowly into ice cold water? The answer is no. No, 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 no. Reason why it hurts is we cramp the muscle that's, that raises and lowers the testes cramps upwards and the result is pain it is the closest we get to your cramps and it is quite temporary <laughs> there's a few other fun things about the testes hell why not because it's always entertaining if you look at the structure it is rigid and the reason why is there are so many tubes packed inside of it. They're called um, seminiferous tubules. There are so many tubes packed inside that they need a hard shell on the outside to contain them. So it is possible to pop it. And if it pops, it literally explodes outwards. It is also the most sensitive part on any human's body. There are more neurons ending with you know, sensory cells per unit area in the testicles than anywhere else on any human. The second most would be the female breast area. That's second most. This is the first most, which means literally when, have you all, well, ladies, have you been taught the self-defense mechanism? Grab, twist, pull. <laughs> if you've been taught grab, twist, pull, and you're like, I don't know if that's going to work, the answer is yes, it will. The answer absolutely is yes, it will. Because if you were to grab, twist, and pull hard enough, you could kill him from pain. Do you, I don't know if you know that you could die from pain. You can die from pain, and you can do that to a male. We can't do it to you, but you can do it to us. I have just revealed our secret weakness. And all the guys are like, I didn't know that. You're welcome. I don't want to know what you're looking at. All the tubes inside of the testicle eventually going to end at this structure called the epididymis, which is going to be a big old collecting vessel at the back. So this is just a collector. And eventually it needs to leave on out. So the tube on out is going to be called the ductus deferens. Ductus deferens is the human name. There is a all the other mammals' names. They are called the vas deferens. If you were to sever the vas deferens or the ductus deferens, cut is an ectomy. So if you have a mastectomy, it's the cutting of the breast tissue. If you have an appendectomy, it's the cutting of the appendix. So what would be the severing? of the ductus deferens, a vasectomy. They usually are so polite that they make the guy do it himself. So it's lots of numbing, lots and lots of numbing. Also, you will be shaved smoother than a baby's butt because you don't want anything interfering. They'll make a small incision at the top of the scrotum. They'll insert the scissors and they say, here, just squeeze 
and you'll do that, you'll feel some pressure there. You're totally numbed up, very numbed up, but you still feel the pressure. And congratulations, you sterilized yourself. The catch is you have to make sure that the, the cut is then tied off correctly because if it grows back, it, it didn't hold. And also, for the sake of also saying it, it's not like it all stays here and then you turn it on, switch, it goes evac, evac, and then it all shoots out. Like, it stays in here for a while. So you're actually, it takes a while, and there's like weird instructions that go with it in order to flush the system out. Anywho, the ductus deferens is going to be a big old long tube that is going to loop around this big old structure that's called the prostate. The prostate produces prostatic fluid. Prostatic fluid is going to be there to help make sure that the sperm can do their thing. If you are a guy, if you live long enough, you will get prostate cancer. All guys will get prostate cancer, or you die before you got prostate cancer. For the most part, prostate cancer is not lethal. It is a very small subset that turns out to be um, dangerous. The easiest way to find out is we can do blood draws. They're not as accurate. The easiest way to do it is you got to feel up the prostate. How do you do that? Well, if you take a look, there's the prostate. That's your anus, and that's your rectum. And oh, I was using a finger. Correct. Finger on in, and you push. It's uh, Once you hit uh, 40 to 45, it depends on if you have family history. If you have family history, 40, no history, about 45. You get to go in as part of your annual physical, what uh, I have once heard jokingly referred to as the fickle finger of fate. <laughs> where you pay someone money to put on a glove, lots of lube, and reach on in and say hello to you. <laughs> I'm two years away from it, so. <laughs> yeah. I've been told it's like a minute of awkwardness. And you're all awkward, but the nurse or the doctor who's doing it is like, just come on. It's the, I hope you went to the bathroom beforehand. The reason why I say that is if you are paralyzed, have you ever wondered how do you poop? Because if you're paralyzed, the muscles don't work. And this here is skeletal muscle to control this. So how do you poop? You have to trigger a reflex. How do you do that? You have to reach in and stretch it. It's called a digital reflex, because digits. And what you'll do is if you stretch enough, boom, and out it comes. Which means if you're going to go and have your prostate checked, you can't like, hold on, I need to go, but hold on, I'll quickly get my prostate checked. No. No, you don't do that. You make sure that you don't need to go, and then you get your prostate checked. Because otherwise, that's an extra fee. Because, <laughs> no. <laughs> As we loop around the prostate, what we're going to have is it's going to fuse in with the urinary, with the tube leading out of the urinary bladder, so your urethra. At that junction, what you're going to find are a pair of glands called the seminal vesicles. These are going to produce most of the seminal fluid. I can't spell. So it's going to make the most of the volume of what turns out to be in semen. On the way out, it's going to pass by some glands called the bulbal urethral glands. 
These produce mucus. Actually, misspelled it. Mucus. In humans, it's not particularly great, but in other animals, it's particularly good. Why mucus? One more time. Nope. Has something to do with the sticky. It's to make a plug after impregnation to say, I got here first. You're not allowed in. The thing is, part of the prostatic uh, juice are enzymes to destroy a mucus plug. So it's a game of whose enzymes are better and whose plugs are better. So there's all sorts of sperm wars going on. It's weird. Uh, urethra, I think you can figure that one out. Penis, eh. okay. <laughs> if you look at a penis, do I have a cross section of it? I don't. If you look at it at a cross section, do I have one later on? I don't. It's weird. Looks like this. So it kind of looks like a South Park character. <laughs> so these two things here are called the corpora cavernosa. They fill up with blood. When they do so, we call that an erection. Uh, the way that works is blood flows in, and as it flows in, it shuts off the ability for it to flow out. It is triggered, so the swelling, it's a bunch of spongy tissue that just swells up. It's sensitive to nitric oxide gas. There's a medication that turn so there's a medication that was made that influences nitric oxide gas. Do you happen to know the name of this medication? Viagra. Why did we make Viagra? So old guys can get their jollies? No. It's meant. Yes, for the heart. So there's a phenomenon. So we didn't talk about it here, but so you have your heart. Then right next to your heart, you have these things that are called your lungs. Kind of looks like a Dumbo. It turns out that if you have low blood flow through your lungs, it affects your heart. So if you were born with malformed lungs, so rather than having full size, literally you have deformed lungs, the result is the blood vessels are smaller and it's going to be harder for you to pump blood between your body and your lungs, which means in order for it to try and compensate, you need to pump blood more. And the result of this, at a very early age, is your heart gets bigger than it should be. And this is called a cardiac hypertrophy. Well, the result of this, of your heart hypertrophying, is it causes hypertension. Your heart's pushing too hard, and it's to compensate for the fact that your lungs are malformed. And because your lungs are malformed, your heart needs to pump even faster and harder to overcome what's gone wrong. This in you is not good, but you'll survive. This in a newborn baby will blow out the capillaries in the eyeballs, will blow out the capillaries in the lungs will blow out capillaries in your ears, will blow out the capillaries in your kidneys. So this is a very bad situation for a newborn. So there was a drug invented 
that lowered the blood pressure for this very specific situation. Its brand name is Viagra. The point of Viagra is not to have Grandpa be happy. It's to save the lives of little kids who have this weird version of hypertension. I worked with someone who had a son who had this. And the kid had to get horse pill sized versions of Viagra to the point where if you go to a pharmacy, they don't like make the pills. You have to get them from the manufacturer. And the dad had to learn how to be his own pharmacist because he has to take the pills, grind them up, combine them with the right amount of chalk, and make his kids own pills. And every month, or actually no, it wasn't every month, because I, I would remember him complaining about it. It'd be like every couple of months, he would need to renew the subscription, or the subscription, the prescription, and the insurance companies would say, your kid doesn't have any history of erectile dysfunction. There's no reason to subscribe, you know, to prescribe this. And it's a, do you not know the point of the medication? Like, yeah, it's an eight-year-old. We don't need to worry about the eight-year-old having an erection or not. We want to worry about, is the eight-year-old going to die today or not from hypertension? And every time he needed to renew, he had to fight the insurance company saying, no, why does a 12-year-old need ED medication? It's not medication for ED. It's not that. Look at the size pills that we're getting. This is not normal. Anyway, it's worth a little side detour because it is a male exclusive problem. Also, with the erection, and it shuts off blood supply, which is why it remains turgid. That means there is no blood flow, which means if it doesn't stop, it starts to die. And the only, there's two solutions. Option number one, needle goes on in, and we start pulling the blood out. It's going gonna, it's gonna to pop like a balloon. And being an individual who has one of these, mm. oh, it, oh, that would hurt. Oh, 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 no, no, no. Option number two is if it starts to die, you snip it off. Also, as one of the individuals of the human species who has one, no, 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 just no, 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 uh, just, no, uh, no. If you were to take these structures here, we're just going to rearrange their location. And if I do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these and flip them up inside. And yeah, that's about it. Voila, we have the female anatomy. Everything is effectively the exact same. The ovaries are the ovaries. The thing is, their uterine duct, here it's referred to as an oviduct. Technically speaking, if you talk about humans, we call it the uterine duct. All other mammals are oviducts. Sure, okay. They also have another name. Fallopian tubes, yeah. These things are entertaining. So these fimbri, the ends, these are separated from the ovary. The ovary, when there's an ovulation event and we pop an egg out, it is now floating inside of the female body cavity. And it needs to get sucked into the uterine tube. But there's weird things that can go on. What we can do, I can chop off, chop out this ovary, and I can snip off 
this uterine tube, she'll still get pregnant because the egg, we don't know how, will move from one side to the other. We do not know how it works, but it's been documented many times that that's perfectly possible. These fimbri here, that would be the epididymis in the guy. The uterine tube or the fallopian tube or the oviduct, that would be the ductus deferens in the guy. It's the same anatomy. Which means, as we look at these tubes that then come on in and fuse on through, what would this structure then be in the male? So in the female, it's the uterus. What's the male version? Yeah, all I have to do is keep comparing. It's the prostate. The exact same structure, which is a weird way to look at it. It's the same structure. Because again, we have one body plan and we just need to be able to specialize them in either way. Human eggs, actually mammalian eggs, are pretty sturdy, resistant structures, so they're pretty good. Sperm are a little delicate. They need a lot of hand holding and you have to say good job and you'll give them gold stars and stuff like that, which is why this list is so much worse than this list. The default is pretty simple. It's the new kid on the block who actually kind of makes it a little bit complicated. The uterus is obviously where we're hoping to catch a baby. The, layer, the area where you're going to catch that baby is referred to as the endometrium. In case this is for the guys who don't know this, ladies, you're fully aware. The endometrium changes size on about a 28-day cycle. I say about because it depends. What's your stress level like? How are you eating? What are you being exposed to? What's your family history? We say the average is 28 days. That does not mean you have to be 28 days. Again, ladies, I know you know this. We're speaking to the penis bearers of the room who don't know such things. The thing with the endometrium is it's ready to catch on a baby. This baby, for reasons that we'll just deal with later, has been floating around inside of these tubes for a while, doing its thing, dividing, and it's getting kind of hungry. So when it finally finds a place to land, it wants food immediately. Well, where in the mother is the food? The bloodstream. So we need to have blood vessels at the ready. This inside layer, the endometrium, is epithelium. Epithelium isn't super vascular, so what we need to do is fluff up the pillows. So the endometrium will change its size because it swells with blood. And it says, baby, 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 baby. The catch is, much like an erection, you can only maintain this high level of blood supply for so long before death kicks in. Again, guys are a little sensitive. We can only maintain this for about four hours before death starts to happen. Ladies, you can pull it off for about two weeks. Good for you. So after about those two weeks, if nothing happens, we need to redo the sheets. Most mammals just take it back. 
humans and most of the other great apes do not. They get to say, out with the sheets. So for the guys to understand this, your homework tonight is you need to paint your hand black or brown or purple or pink. Pink. We should do pink, actually. <laughs> so we're going to paint it pink. And your job is remove the paint from your hand without touching your hand. Oh, and you can't add water because that's touching your hand. So how are you going to do it? How do you do it? So you can do this all you want. You just can't have anything touch your hand. So what do you do? You wait for it to dry, and then you crinkle your hand. And if you do that, eventually you get some of it to start to flakes, which means you kind of like, oh, and you start trying harder and harder and harder and harder, and eventually it all flakes off. Or a good chunk of it flakes off. The uterus, again, as many of you are far more aware than I am, is a massive muscle ball. Prostate, not so much. But this one, this is all muscle. So what it's going to do is we need to get rid of this inner layer, and it's going to do so by squeezing. And the squeezing, I would imagine, is not painful, because usually it's referred to not as a contraction, but as a cramp, which then leads to this fun point. And then we're almost done with the slide, and that's where we're going to stop. Ladies, I would have no clue who amongst you is going through this right now. No clue. Why? Because you've been trained not to say anything. I don't know why you've been trained, but you've been trained not to say anything. Guys who do not need to bleed through their penis once a month while going through how many days of this non-stop cramping sensation going on? Like, many? The answer is more than I want or that you want. Um, they have a list of names on a piece of paper or probably on a computer that's based upon people they don't know who take a piece of leather that gets thrown around between people on a big grass field and based upon how that piece of leather gets tossed around, they get so pissed off that they put their feet through televisions that cost lots of money. And yet we are told that women, you can't be trusted because you are hormonal. Even though guys destroy stuff because of fantasy football. <laughs> Not going to lie, I don't get it. I don't get it. And I'm on the benefiting side of that system, and I don't get it. Cervix is the exit portal. It is a very good place for cancer to exist because it is quite rough there, which means it is constantly being regrown. So it's a perfect spot for cancer. There's a virus that particularly likes it called HPV. And so a male doctor came up with a way to test for it. His last name was quite long, but it abbreviates to PAP. And he came up with a way to make a smear of the cervix. Guys, so here's what the test is. We're going to take your penis. We're going to stretch it open. What we're then going to do with this stretched open penis is we're going to shove a rod into it. Don't worry, it'll be cold all the way down until it gets to your prostate. And then we're going to scrape the inside of your prostate to see if you have prostate cancer. I don't know how many of the ladies have had pap smears yet, but did I get mildly close to starting the uncomfortableness? Yeah. <laughs> it's supposed to be quite awful. Because it's not necessarily going to be nice scraping either. It's literally, it's scraping tissue off. So guys, again, we're doing this through your penis. No. No, no you're not.
we will talk or start Thursday by talking about the vagina. Because the vagina is not what you think it is.